As some of you know, I speak a bit of Burmese, and I regularly find myself in a Yangon taxi talking to the driver. I'm an English girl. I married a Burmese man. And they go, ah, oh, I can't like that. And I say, please, put your hands back on the steering wheel. Uh, they say, I can't like that. Napusa, you are there. Can't I? Can't I? So, what are we talking about there? A little bit of Burmese. Napu, your forehead. Sa, writing. You are is the village, and Lere is to go around. So what they're saying to me is, you started off in one village, you went all around the houses, and eventually you arrived in Yangon and met the man of your destiny, the man of your dreams. And I say, yeah, I guess so. He's sitting somewhere down there. So um, which village did I start off in? So I was born um, actually in the US, but I grew up in Oxford in a university town. My, my parents were academics, and I went from Oxford over to Cambridge, studied pathology, and then to University of Chicago. And it was after that that I joined the Foreign Office. I became a diplomat. I arrived in Rangoon on my first posting, 1990, and I'll come back to how I got there. But in the meantime, my destiny, my Napuza, was born in a small village called uh, Mesligon in the north of the Delta, Irrawaddy region. And he had a normal boy's life, um, already showing artistic tendencies, and as a result, they sent him to Rangoon to study law, because that's the way it works here. And he was in Rangoon University in 1988, and being the way he is, he got involved, and being the way he is, he got thrown out. Um, and so he was very much part of those student demonstrations in 88, which then, when the military took over, took him on a very long journey, first to the Indian border, to Manipur, and then to the Chinese border, and then back, and then through three jails. And eventually, he ended up back in Yangon, where he met and married the British ambassador, which obviously was where you would expect him to end up, and that was me. <laughs> so. What started me on that journey to Rangoon was a lighthouse. It was actually two lighthouses at opposite ends of the earth. One is a lighthouse off the coast of Scotland, Tyree, called the Skerivor. It was built in about 1844, and then about 20 years later, in the colonial times, they used the exact same model to build a lighthouse off the coast of Burma. Now, I had an early boyfriend, don't talk to, tell my husband that, but I had an early boyfriend whose father was the trustee of the Scottish Lighthouse, and the two of them were lucky to get a visa in about 1985 to come out and visit the sister lighthouse in Burma. And they brought all of the spare parts that they found in the back of the Scottish Lighthouse, because actually, it turns out you could use them all in Burma, even though they were 20 years out of date back in Scotland. So they came over on that trip and showed me the photos when he came back. And I'd never heard of Burma. I had no colonial grandfather. I had no uncle who died in World War II. But those images of Thanaka, of houses on stilts, of the Delta and the lighthouse really stuck in my mind. And as a result, when I came to join the Foreign Office two or three years later, and they put in front of you a list, and they say, where do you want to go first? What language did you want to learn? And it was Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, Athens, Lagos, and then there was Rangoon. And at the time, it felt random. I just ticked the box Rangoon. I now realize all of this was preordained. But as a result, they sent me off to learn Burmese in London for a few months. And I came out here in July 1990. It was full monsoon. I was sweating, just like I am now, um, sweating in the humidity. Tain Lin, I think, was a lot hotter and stickier. He was, at that time, up on the Indian border. And I got on with my job. And one day, the new light, well, actually, it was the Working People's Daily in those days, a fine name. The Working People's Daily, our daily government newspaper, came through the door, and we read about a press conference. Now, this was a press conference about and given by students who had fled to the border and who had come back. And they told these terrible stories of torture, of executions, and uh, how they'd survived. And we in the embassy, and indeed most people in Burma read it and thought, oh, you know, more military propaganda. We couldn't believe it. We thought this was just a way of undermining the cause of a democracy. But actually, it was a great deal worse. And what I didn't also realize at the time was that the young man that you can see sitting on the edge um, of the row, that was my Napuza. And he also didn't realize that the second secretary in the embassy 
was the woman destined for him. So he went back to his village. I left Rangoon. I went to Brussels, six years there. And I came back in uh, 2002 as ambassador. So at that stage, Tain Lin had gone into his jail career. It was, uh, by that stage, he was at Miao Miao Jail back in the Delta. And when I went to present my credentials to the senior general, which was on the 31st of December 2002, which was Tain Lin's 36th birthday by chance. I was 36 too, I was one of the youngest ambassadors. And I presented my credentials, the photograph was showed in the newspaper, and a few days later, the newspaper was smuggled into Miao Miao Jail, as often happened, and all the political prisoners had one of their sort of regular political chats, and they decided to pick for today's topic, why has Britain sent an ambassador to Burma? The US have not done it, and nor should the Brits. And Tain Lin was absolutely adamant that this was the case. Fortunately, my government was not listening to him. So I was there, I got the job, I tried to do what I could to support the cause of democracy, they were difficult times, and often we would find uh, people turning up at our door unannounced, mostly undercover journalists, to, uh, to ask us about this. And one day, I got a call from reception. A woman called Lyndall was sitting there. Lyndall, are you out there somewhere? She should be somewhere out there. So Lyndall, I didn't know, I'd heard of her. She came up, and she said, You've got, to, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. There's these amazing, amazing paintings. You've got to put them somewhere safe. We've heard you do that kind of thing. I said, maybe, tell me more. So she told me and she showed me the leaflet of an exhibition by a recently released political prisoner called Tain Lin. And she said, these are paintings which are painted on prison uniforms. They've all got stamped on the back, property of the prison department. We need to get them out of here, otherwise um, they'll get uh, seized soon. Can you help? And I said, okay, look, send him round and I'll, I'll see what I can do. So one afternoon, he came round to my residence. And I remember as we sat there drinking tea and we were drinking it from the, the gold rimmed teacups. And I remember looking at his head, which was quite shaven at the time and thinking, gosh, there's some interesting scars on that head. I wonder where they came from. And so I learned more about his story. He, in turn, was looking at me and thinking, gosh, when we read about the British ambassador, we'd assume she was some old crone of 60. And this chick seems quite young. <laughs> so we got talking. I took his, his paintings. I packed them and sent them off to Amsterdam, where there's an archive, which keeps some of the sort of social history of, of Myanmar safe. And we used to meet up from time to time, talking about language, talking about politics, talking about art. And over the following sort of six or so months, I sponsored his art exhibition. At the time, he was so poor, he had to paint on recycled paper. Um, he painted my portrait. And we used to talk about art and artists. And one night, we were sitting there watching a DVD about Jackson Pollock in my residence, and then he didn't go home. Now, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so, in Myanmar culture, it's really quite simple. You hang your loungies on the line together. It's an established relationship. When you're an ambassador, it's a bit different. Number one, you don't do your laundry, okay? <laughs> but number two, you know, when your lover is potentially an enemy of the state and, uh, you know, you have a certain position, you, you wonder what you're meant to do. So I turned to the diplomatic practice guide to see what I could find. <laughs> it wasn't in there. <laughs> So I thought to myself, OK, what should we do? Well, I've been told that in my staff, there is bound to be an informer for military intelligence. Everybody's told me. You know, they're telling um, MI, all the visitors coming to your, your house each day. Um, and even, actually, there were people who refused to come to my house because they insisted that there was somebody sitting with a camera in one of the towers of the Methodist Central Church across the, the gate. So I said, you know, they're bound to find out sooner or later because they would see Tain Lin coming in and out every morning going to his English classes, going to his studio. But the weeks went on, and it was quite clear that the word was not getting through, and I felt somewhat sort of disappointed by this. So I thought, OK, let me at least put the word out to my embassy. So we were doing a blood donation, and I, I took Tainlin along, you know. Work it out for yourselves, guys, which my embassy staff, being smart people, did. Not military intelligence, however. So then we thought, OK, Tain Lin was going to get a passport. He actually went and told the agent that he was going out with the British ambassador. 
The guy didn't take notes. So then we went to his village, and we had to put in a diplomatic note because they had to arrange a security detail. Um, and so, you know, the word was now official. And then we went off to uh, UK for the first time. Now, along the way, there had been somebody who'd worked it out, Zagana, a friend of both of ours, who had given Tain Lin two green silk loungies, matching silk loungies for his marriage. And he'd given them to me and said, we'll wear these when we get married. And I said, yes, but you do under our British traditions have to first ask me. But I put them to one side. So I took him to a friend's wedding and let him do a little bit of research into these quaint English customs. Um, and so he discovered the concept of the proposal. And then we went to Cornwall. And in Cornwall, I discovered everywhere Tainlin goes, art follows, or comes along in the car with us. And in this particular case, I was sitting there on the beach and reading um, the newspaper, and he was scuffing around. And he told me to go up to the top of the beach and say, you know, what do you think? And I said, you've got the grammar wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, OK, uh, let we, let we. <laughs> So, we returned, and by that stage, the word had got out. And the senior general had called in the forest minister, who was from the village, and said, what's going on? The British ambassador's marrying somebody in your village. Find out about it. So the forest minister went rushing back. And fortunately, our visit had been documented by security and put all together in an album called Moments of Wonderfulness. <laughs> And so every step of our visit was there, and he was briefed, and he reported back. And he, but the general said, have they got married yet? Have they got married yet? We need to know. Now, we hadn't at that stage got married. We did then go on to marry um, many, many times for various religious, bureaucratic, and social reasons, including at the Mahazi Monastery. And what we found at our marriage was that we didn't have the relatives to fill the kind of the groom's photo, or the groom's family, the bride's family, but we had enough for Meow Meow Jail, we had enough for Mandalay Jail, we had the jungle, we had the 88 generation, and as a result, we had special branch outside clicking all the time as a backup set of wedding photos. <laughs> so, we married, um, and there are many others in my situation, I think, many other Western women who have married Burmese men, so I asked them, what's been the biggest challenge for you? Because for me, it was actually the bureaucracy and the paperwork of getting the visas. They said, the main challenge for us is usually the in-laws, and it's more specific than that. It's usually the washing machine. <laughs> Why? Because in Myanmar custom, men's and women's undergarments are not meant to be mixed. It's bad for the man. It affects his masculinity, his pong. And some of my friends say that they'd found their in-laws looking through the laundry basket to see whether the lazy wife was mixing it up. Now, I am very, very relieved that my mother-in-law has never, to my knowledge, looked in my washing machine. Her reaction on us marrying is, oh my God, thank God my son is going to eat, finally. Uh, because she had seen you know, a son in the jungle in jail, and then she was expecting him to be a penniless artist. So marrying an ambassador, she thought, is going to get him at least three square meals a day, which it certainly has. Um, we found that actually through a shared uh, art and culture and a shared commitment to things like freedom of expression, there hasn't really been that much difference in our two cultures. And Tain Lin himself is a very adaptable person, so wherever he goes, he uses art. And so my friends would ask him, how do you find London now that you're living there? And he would paint it. He would mix up Lorcanat on top of Nelson's column, and he did the same for Amsterdam, for Brussels, for Venice, uh, and so on. So it's been art, culture, language, which has brought us together. But there has been one other group which has had a different narrative, the military government. We discovered this the other day. We met a Frenchman who had been detained by military intelligence. And they said to him, do you know Vicky Bowman? And he said, well, I think I've met her at a conference or two. And they said, do you know what she did? She kidnapped our Myanmar artist and she took him to London. <laughs> I think it was... Destiny. There was, no, there was no struggle on my hands. We were destined to marry. It was our Napusa. Thank you very much. <laughs>